much. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the spring 2020 iteration of Public Health 6010, Essentials of Public Health. Um, today, we're going to talk very, very broadly under the umbrella um, relevant to public health considerations of diversity and inequality. And specifically, we're going to talk about environmental justice, and this will be lecture A um, in that um, particular uh, block. My name is Daryl Hood. I am an associate professor as well as the course coordinator um, for this course. I'm in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences um, here in the College of Public Health. Um, as well, I have a courtesy appointment uh, in the Department of Neuroscience uh, in the College of Medicine, okay? And so, as we begin, of course, we have learning objectives that um, we would have you pay particular attention to. Um, the first learning objective under the Environmental Justice Lecture today um, is to develop an understanding of ethical, social, and environmental justice issues that plague high-risk communities and we'll get into the definitions later on. I'd also like for you to be able to understand the use of both the um, EHS model that Dr. Bassetti spoke with you about in the last module, as well as the a public health exposome framework that I'm going to introduce you to. And this is for the purposes of our being able to characterize latent associations of susceptibility across the life course, okay? And this will be particularly relevant to disparate health outcomes in the um, health disparities diaspora. Of course, we're gonna be speaking about all of this from an environmental justice perspective. The third learning objective will be for you to understand the use of risk communication tools and methodology towards better informing vulnerable populations, okay? And this will be particularly relevant to um, potential exposure um, to um, smokestack emissions, um, as well as environmental contaminants in general, okay? And that's towards facilitating prevention and decreasing um, the public health burden, of course, in those types of intervention studies that Dr. Fergusich probably spoke to you about, okay? And so here's our outline. Um, we'd like to begin um, today talking about reality versus equality versus equity versus injustice. So we're gonna put some discrete or definitive definitions to each of those terms, okay? And then I will use um, coal-fired electrical power plants and fossil fuel combustion in general um, as sort of a framework to begin our discussion on um, exposures. From an EJ perspective, I'd like to introduce you to the public health exposome. And then I have three cases that we'll talk about today. The first case is from Texas. Um, the second case is from um, Washington Heights um, and East Harlem in New York. And then the third case, we'll conclude with um, the case in Perry, Florida. I think you'll find that quite interesting. And then we will um, summarize the material. Now, of course, after the lecture, you will have a quiz. Um, go ahead, take the quiz right after you look at the lecture. As well, um, we'll have a case study um, that you'll have an opportunity to demonstrate your knowledge um, in this area, okay? Very good, so let's go. And so, um, of course, you probably um, recall uh, from watching however you receive your media, you certainly have been able to uh, discern over the past um, six, seven, eight years, um, the reality that the principal factor that is negatively impacting susceptible populations across our country here is exposure to smokestack emissions uh, from coal-fired electrical power plants, okay? And so here's the former EPA Administrator, Lisa Jackson. Um, she was the, um, of course, the EPA Administrator under the Obama Administration. 
Um, and she, of course, was very, very concerned about these types of emissions. Um, and of course, President Obama <coughs> attempted to put in place some controls on <coughs> carbon emissions, excuse me, <coughs> but um, that um, he fell a little bit short in that regard. Nevertheless, this brought to the forefront the presence of environmental justice communities in um, our country, in the communities across America. And an environmental justice community is a community in which the population tends to be disproportionately affected by environmental hazards and um, consequently the community suffers disparate health outcomes as a result of exposure to these particular hazards. Here at the Ohio State University we have developed um, a public participatory geographical information system portal where and you'll learn a little bit about those um, as we proceed in the lecture. Um, I list two here and we'll um, I'll introduce you to those later uh, in the lecture. Um, but um, as we go forward, here is a quick snapshot, if you will, um, of one of the vulnerable communities that we're going to pay particular attention to here um, today um, in the southern gateway of Columbus, Ohio. This happens to be the Stanbaugh Elwood community that we will talk about um, ad nauseum in um, lecture B. So recall that. But as you can see here, here is the portal. This um, is, of course, yes, this comes from my laboratory here at the Ohio State University. And as you can see, it contains various active layers where residents of disenfranchised and high-risk communities can actually go there and find out various health statistics, um, uh, uh, statistics and data on land use, data on toxic release inventory facilities, data on particulate matter at 2.5 microns, uh, laid out in a 12, 5, and 2 kilometer grid, as well as just uh, general data, as you can see here. So we will get back to that as, as we proceed. And so, um, we began the discussion um, from the perspective that place actually does matter with regard to healthcare disparities and disparate health outcomes. And by that we are speaking of um, with regard to health outcomes, it isn't so much your genetic code, because we saw that, Craig Minter and his group solved the genetic code um, several years ago. But it's more about where, it's more about place, um, it's more about the places in which you live, work, play, and pray, as we can see here. And that then comprises the built environment. When you look at this figure here, you can see um, from a network perspective, right, um, these are nodes, if you will, you can see the individual um, is actually um, interacting with um, his community, and that, of course, by community, we mean the places he lives, all right, um, where the individual actually works, probably somewhere. So we have to consider the workplace, um, where, um, of course, potential exposures um, might to chemical and non-chemical stressors might occur. And, of course, within that context, um, you also have to consider the overall community, which is represented by the individuals down there um, at the bottom here. Well, not only do you have to consider the built environment, one has to also consider the social environment. And that's, of course, um, where we talk about the social determinants of health, of course, race, ethnicity, education, um, uh, your income, of course, and whether or not you have health insurance, and the general culture. And so this then comprises um, the built, natural, physical, and social environment in which individuals live. Well, uh, individuals also, uh, within that context, live then are relegated to a particular policy environment. And that then, of course, starts at the local and state municipality level, um, and then moves up to the state and then up to the federal level. Okay, so various laws and regulations governing land use are, are, are um, extremely relevant. And so 
when you take all of this together, um, we have actually um, devised a framework where one can then um, segment and partition these various domains um, of what we call the exposed zone, the totality of one's exposure from birth uh, until uh, the time that you die. We've also developed a tool chain whereby we are able to gauge and assess and associate the impact of various moderating factors um, that they have um, on um, one's exposed home. And of course, we're able to look at this from a population level now in terms of disparities. And so we've done this with respect to cardiometabolic disease, lung cancer mortality, all-cause mortality between um, blacks and whites. And also, um, and this is my favorite area, with regard to adverse pregnancy outcomes, um, particularly with regard to infant mortality, preterm birth, low birth weight, and very low birth weight. And so, um, and in summary here, this slide is demonstrating to you um, the potential impact of exposure to chemical and non-chemical stressors. Um, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences um, ha, um, looks as a strategic plan, of course, um, that is based on exposure to chemical and non-chemical stressors. And so within, the, within that framework, we, of course, have to look at our moderating behaviors in terms of the outcome there at the bottom um, under disparate health outcomes. And I'll say more about the omics um, as we proceed forward here. Now, there is a monumental difference, of course, between equity, equality, and reality. And this slide is demonstrating that. And so if you've never seen this, take a moment to sort of notice that we all aren't um, advantaged with respect to being able to begin on an even playing field. And so um, if you take a look here, let's start at the equality box here. You can see that uh, equality is uh, exemplified by um, these three individuals being, being able to be placed onto um, a cart, and as you can see, the cart is the same height, um, of course, but the outcome of the individuals being on the cart um, is disproportionate. Of course, the first individual can in fact see into the park, can see the game and everything in it, but the second individual, who is about half the size of the first individual, um, is able to see in also because of being propped up onto the um, box, the cart. The third individual isn't able to see at all, but still receive the same prop as the first and second individual. This represents the concept of equality, and the assumption then is that everyone benefits from the same support system. Um, this is viewed in our society as equal treatment. If we move over to the equity um, um, cartoon right next to it, we can see where the concept is that everyone is provided the support that they need in our society. Um, this, of course, um, is grounded. You might, um, there might be an analogy to affirmative action in this regard. Um, so if everyone gets what they need, then of course um, you have um, equity. Um, well, maybe, maybe not, right? Um, we all know that um, in reality though, if we come back to the first box, this is the real situation. And some individuals are simply um, born um, and have certain advantages that others don't. And this, of course, um, runs the spectrum. Um, so you see the first individual has, you know, set one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, boxes that they can stand on. They are well above um, being able to access and, and see the game there. In, in the park, the game. The next individual, of course, only has one box, and some people, that third individual, has no boxes, okay? And so um, the, 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 this concept with respect to equality and equity um, is, can be uh, exemplified 
And um, as you can see here in the last box, um, when we talk about true liberation here, you can see that um, all three of the individuals can see the game in the park without any support or any accommodation whatsoever. Because primarily the, uh, the inequality was addressed, okay? Meaning uh, essentially that the systemic barriers to access have been removed and thereby everyone then um, is able to have um, equal access. And so, um, yes, there is a monumental difference uh, as it relates to the point at which we all um, can um, begin our journey. And so um, here is the research group that I want to tell you a little bit about. This is um, our interdisciplinary cardiometabolic public health exposome team. We call ourselves ICE-T. We've done quite a bit of um, research uh, into um, this area looking using our public health exposome um, framework. Um, as you can see here, um, we have uh, Vanderbilt University, Meharry Medical College, the University of Tennessee, Tulane University, the Un University Space Research Administration um, Association, that's down in Huntsville, Alabama, as well as the Risk Science Center at the University of Cincinnati, and the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, that's UTMB. These are the individuals that work um, with me on um, the exposome methodology. And as I've indicated before, the exposome um, is a measure of one's exposures across the life course. Um, that would be from conception to death, and they relate to optimal health. Now, as I just mentioned to you, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, which is the uh, NIH Institute that funded me for over um, 20 years, we've now moved to funding from the United States Environmental Protection Agency under the Science to Achieve Results Initiative. Um, they adopted this um, paradigm in terms of the exposome paradigm uh, in their 2012-2017 um, strategic plan. Out of that grew the concept of the public health exposome, okay? So um, this is the exposome as it relates to population level health outcomes, um, individual and community as well. And so the public health exposome then is a longitudinal, cumulative, it's longitudinal and cumulative uh, with an environmental exposure context. And it, of course, considers one's exposure from birth until um, death, okay? And as I mentioned before, it's measured at the population level. Now, and so, as one moves from a healthy to a disease state, you, this slide captures the reality and the concept that it is done so within the context of the built natural and physical environment. As you can see here, environmental toxicants impact that progression. Genetic vulnerability impacts that progression from healthy to disease state. Um, other diseases, of course, impact that. Your nutrition, your nutritional state, behavior. Yes, we have all have different behaviors. These are moderators which either positively, positively or negatively impact your progression from going from a healthy state to a disease state. And of course, your age and development um, impact that also. And over the years, we've used um, uh, surrogates of exposure here. Um, my laboratory uses benzoapyrene exposure um, as the environmental component there, okay? Um, benzopyrene is the prototypical polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Um, and it's formed from any combustion process will, will um, generate benzopyrene. And so now we can look at the public health exposome framework in totality and see that an individual, of course, uh, up here at the top, um, is, um, lives within a community. And we went through a few slides ago what that community entails. And so all of one's exposures presumably occur within the context of where they live, work, eat, and play, right? Okay. 
And so um, with regard to the community, one knows that there's a physical, built, social, and, and, and physical environment there, right? Um, there are certain moderating factors that we just went over, right? A few of them are listed here, the community assets, social supports, whether or not you have access to care, pre-existing conditions, all of these moderating factors then impact um, where you're going to be with regard to moving from a healthy to a disease state. And of course, um, we saw the genetic code, as, you can, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, we now know all about epigenetics, and we're learning more and more every day about epigenetics and all of the omics methodologies, right? And of course, we uh, pointed out to you on previous slides that um, another moderating factor, if you will, would be, of course, the stage of development, your psychosocial makeup, and of course, um, personal behaviors. And all of this goes into calculating um, one's risk trajectory as for any chronic disease, as we'll see very shortly. And so um, amongst these um, Amongst these cases that I'm going to be presenting to you um, today and on the next block, um, we are looking at um, the southern, um, the southern gateway communities here in Columbus, and I've listed them here. Um, these communities came about as a result of Governor of, of Mayor Coleman's um, um, programs down in that area to sort of slate these areas for urban renewal and. As you can see here, we have them listed, Stambaugh Elwood community, the Reeve Hosack community, Ennis Gardens Village, Marion Village, Bassa Village, and Hungarian Village. All of these comprise the southern gateway of communities here in Columbus. And with the aid of our public health exposure on framework, we are able to then use combinatorial algorithms um, supervised and unsupervised clustering methodologies, Bayesian analysis, and other types of big data to knowledge um, analytics to then um, make certain associations um, between latent constructs that were previously unavailable, okay? And this then um, sets us up for understanding um, how some of these disparate health outcomes um, occur in, in a place-based manner. This is an example of a cardiometabolic exposome. Um, you can sort of um, look at it uh, when you get time, but I want to just sort of show you um, what the cardiometabolic exposome um, looked like, okay? Um, yes, um, and so here in Franklin County, we do have a problem with emissions um, because uh, uh, they aren't uh, regulated as much um, as in, for example, um, Tennessee, uh, where I just moved here from. And this slide shows the total toxic emissions in pounds. And so since 2009, we've seen a trend where, in fact, these um, emissions have been, of course, decreasing from 2009, 10. They increased a little bit, uh, sort of um, plateauing. Uh, in 2011, but in 12, 13, and 14, 15, 16, and 17, they continued to um, decrease somewhat. However, um, even though the emissions have been decreasing, other aspects of um, the social determinants and other aspects of, of potential exposure um, have been increasing. Other aspects of disparate health outcomes have been uh, pretty much almost opposite from those decreases in emissions. And so while we are happy that the emissions have decreased, we aren't happy about the disparate health outcomes. And so this slide is just indicating um, how uh, the fact that toxic chemicals actually do find their way um, into cord blood. Um, and this was a CNN special uh, a few years ago. This was Sanjay Gupta who um, had a special on um, um, children expo exposed before birth, meaning um, in utero. And so um, you can see some of the compounds listed there across the bottom. 
But now, um, getting back to the exposed zone, but now that we have um, these very, very um, uh, heavy, these data heavy frameworks, um, we now can possibly um, contribute to devising a framework that will contribute to um, understanding why we have um, disparate health outcomes in high risk and vulnerable communities. And so with the confluence of all of this environmental data, we have all of this domain knowledge from an interdisciplinary perspective that use combinatorial algorithms. Um, we also have use of computers like Kraken2 and these supercomputer platforms. This then will help us understand um, these disparate health outcomes within the context of the public health exposure. So here is our simplified systems analytical tool chain for um, health disparities research. Um, imagine, if you will, for a moment that you have all of this heterogeneous data. Um, that data can then be um, analyzed and, and reduced to what we call correlation matrices. Um, this involves unweighted graphs, which in particular dense subgraphs um, sort of present themselves where upon you are able to um, test different hypotheses um, and then from there you can validate um, these hypotheses through various studies, validation studies, and then of course presumably you will have um, and those studies and the results of those studies will provide significant input into um, environmental public health policy. Over the years we have now published about 11 um, exposed on papers. Um, they're shown here. Please feel free. These are listed in the readings and so um, please avail yourself um, of these um, manuscripts. But it is all for the purposes of um, devising models, if you will, that allow us to be able to predict your chronic disease outcome trajectory as a function of exposure. And as you can see here, on the ordinate, we have decreased cardiometabolic um, disease risk or increased cardiometabolic disease risk, okay? So if you bifurcate the ordinate into um, upper and lower um, percentiles, if you will, um, and then on the bottom, the abscissa put time, one can then um, see that you can devise a model that is predictive in nature. And so the top half of the model um, basically um, is bad, right? If you increase your cardiometabolic risk, that's going to lead to very negative um, deleterious outcomes in terms of health. And so that would be exemplified in the case where one has high lead exposures, high PM 2.5 exposures, that would be particulate matter at 2.5 microns. What about if you had high non-chemical stressor exposures, an unhealthy diet, no exercise, exercise very little. And of course, this is relative to African-Americans because we are focusing our studies initially on African-Americans in these inner city um, neighborhoods that are primarily low socioeconomic status. And if in fact you live in close proximity to a particular point source um, of pollution, okay? There you would expect those outcomes to be extremely negative. And so um, the, <clears throat> what we're showing you here are differential cardiometabolic trajectories, okay? Now let's take the opposite, an opposing scenario where um, this would lead to a decreased cardiometabolic risk. Those would be the situations where there were low lead exposures, very, very low. Although of course we do know that no level of lead is safe, right? But nevertheless, for the purposes of the um, devising this model, we say low lead exposures, low PM 2.5, particulate matter 2.5 exposures. What if your exposures um, were very, very low to chemical and non-chemical stressors, and you ate a healthy diet, and you exercised regularly? Um, if you were African American, of course, but um, what if you were of a high, uh, high socioeconomic status, that is, okay? 
and you live far away from sources of um, pollution, you would then expect that you would have a lower um, trajectory. And so all of these arrows represent differential cardiometabolic trajectories, okay? So um, here's case one, um, or vignette one, I should say very short. This is an environmental justice um, community in Texas. You all remember um, what um, an environmental justice community um, looks like. Here's a map. This is my good friend Jim Dahlgren's work from um, back when um, I was at Meharry uh, Medical College in Vanderbilt University. And so let's look at this map here. And um, you can see here in the middle of this neighborhood, um, there's a Kerr McGee plant, okay? Um, Kerr McGee uh, is a big um, producer um, of, um, is, is, a, is a large producer of, um, at the time, um, uh, plastics, and it also has an agricultural um, subsidiary, okay? Can't say where it is in Texas, but suffice it to say that these, it, it was uh, smokestack emissions, lots of smokestack emissions. And you can see that there's a middle school right in the middle of that particular neighborhood. There's also a waterworks plant here. And um, all of these dots indicate that these are residents who agreed to have um, dust wipe samples taken from their residences as well, okay? And one of the uh, conclusions and findings from that particular um, analysis of those dust wipe samples from those um, areas in this particular neighborhood um, focus on central nervous system dysfunction. And you can see here we have adults and children, and primarily in the children, we can see that when we look at the adjusted differences in these odds ratios here, in terms of lack of concentration and recent and long-term memory loss, um, we can see that they um, stand out and, and were viewed as significant. So this was um, one of the initial studies by Jim and his group that indicated that um, there might be a connection between um, environmental contaminant levels in and around residences um, that were in close proximity to sources of um, pollution. Okay? And we move on now to a situation in New York City. Now this would be um, the Washington Heights um, area uh, and East Harlem areas of um, New York. Um, here we want to focus on benzopyrene and here are some candid shots around New York City whereby um, you can see various smokestack emissions right across the Hudson River of course you have Industrial Alley all of the uh, petrochemical um, plants there spewing um, contamination into um, the atmosphere we have um, the municipal transit bus system of course now I think it's all diesel but back when the um, trade towers came down many of them weren't and of course we have um, the occasion to observe um, um, increasing um, wildland fires um, for an example in the Catskills and of course you can also get components of combustion from cigarettes. Um, we won't talk about that in depth today. And of course, you can even get it from charboiling. And so this compound that's used as a surrogate of exposure, um, benzopyrene of a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, looms large. Um, and so this particular study that I'm gonna tell you about in this case is from the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. And um, here we see um, some of the demographics of the New York City cohort um, used in this particular study. You can see here that they were relatively young. They were primarily, in terms of their ethnicity, um, minorities, either Latina or African American. 90% um, of them were on Medicaid. 65.6% um, of them were, had never been married. 35% less than that had a high school education annual household incomes, pretty low, okay? And then, um, of course, the exclusion criteria um, are listed here. They did not let illicit drug users, um, individuals that were HIV positive with hypertension or diabetes or active smokers were eliminated from this study. Um, and of course, you can see 43.5% um, of them lack basic necessities of life, such as shelter, food, clothing, 
heat and medicine. Now it's somewhat funny here because I didn't know that you could, um, if you look at these boxes to the right, um, we're getting pretty close to uh, Manhattan there and so I did not know that you could find such demographics so close to um, Wall Street. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, those were women, of course, as you can see here, these are um, women um, uh, in their, uh, right, these 175 individuals are women and this is where they live. Now, if you um, uh, recruit them into this study, you would ask them to wear a um, side pack um, on their side, um, which has a filter in it, um, which captures um, particular matter, okay? And so um, these women had to come to Columbia University um, every couple of weeks and turn in the filters uh, from, from their um, side, back side packs here. And um, they were analyzed then for um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, okay? And as you can see here, once these pregnant women um, had their children, okay, then they were able to aggregate the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon content of those filters. And as you can see here, the children separate into two different groups in terms of their functioning on the Bailey Scales of Infant Development, Mental Development Index. And so, if you look at the ordinate of this particular figure here, this is the Bailey Scales of Infant Development, Mental Development Index score on the ordinate, okay, and as you can see here, both high and low pH exposure groups start out at about the same at about 12 months of age. Once the kid gets about 24 months old, that's two years old, you can see um, they end up at about the same place in terms of their Bailey scales of infant development. Some of that's developmental, that's when pruning of synapses is occurring in, in children, in babies, okay? But then, as you can see here, going from two to three years old, um, we see a significant, um, uh, we see a significant departure from the two groups, high and low PAH exposure, um, overlapping each other. And then, as you can see here, um, the high PAH exposure group then um, remains very, very low as opposed to the um, low PAH exposure group you see here. So this blue square here is the low PAH exposure group, and the black square, or diamond, is the high PAH exposure group. And as you can see, the Bailey Scales of Infant Development Mental Development Index um, scores here, that represents about a difference of about nine IQ points. And, um, you know, that's extremely significant um, as it relates to the suggestion, the data here, suggesting that um, in utero exposure to high concentrations of PAH versus low can result in a nine point differential in beta scales of infant development, mental development index. And so um, they follow these kids, uh, they're still following them. This is a longitudinal cohort study, if you will. Here, this slide is showing them at five years old, where you can look at the mean IQ scores um, for full scale verbal and performance IQ between the groups. And still here, the high pH exposure group is suppressed somewhat, okay, relative to the low pH exposure. And so, um, my laboratory, of course, um, was the translational correlate for um, the mechanistic um, pathways that sort of lead to those uh, phenotypes in the kids in New York City. And so this slide is just showing some of the papers that we published together um, based on those data where we took um, information, the epidemiological data from um, impacted communities, right? and set that up in an animal experience, in an animal experiment, to sort of get at some of the molecular level mechanisms that might be operative, um, leading to decreased behavioral learning and memory deficits after um, subsequent to in utero exposure. And so um, our being able to do this based on the epidemiological studies from high-risk communities um, actually did lead to 
um, the US EPA resetting the reference concentrations for the compound um, benzopyrene. Um, and that then resulted in um, lowering, the per, lowering the permissible exposure level for that air contaminant, right? And that then actually represents a public policy change. So we were very, very proud of our work uh, in this area. Um, next, we have a case in um, Florida, okay? And um, this is the blueprint. This was one of um, your um, readings as well. Um, as you can see here, Perry is an environmental justice community. This is showing where Perry is located. Right there, it's right below, um, right south of um, Orlando, okay? And this county is an environmental justice community in part due to its, um, um, due to the fact that it um, houses um, two um, limited partnerships, a uh, paper company, and as you will come to find out, a proposed coal-fired electrical power plant. So in 2006, uh, Perry was targeted for this uh, construction of a coal-fired electrical power plant, primarily uh, to sort of uh, add power to um, Disney uh, World down there in Orlando. And the Taylor Environmental Council, the TEC, um, comprised the Jacksonville Electric Authority, um, as well as the city of Tallahassee and the Reedy Creek Improvement District. And that's, that's the Disney World component, okay? And here are some of the social demographics um, of Perry, as you can see here. Um, they are, um, if you look at Perry versus Taylor County, Taylor County, Florida, it's very, very obvious. Um, you can see most of these individuals are minority. They are blue collar workers primarily. Um, the unemployment uh, in Perry is a little bit higher. Uh, people over 25 with a high school education is running about 70% or so. But about 27% um, percent of the individuals are below the poverty level. Rental occupied domiciles running around a third or so. Households lacking complete plumbing facilities, very low. And the housing values are respectable, okay? Very respectable. But in Perry, you see they're a little lower than they are in Taylor County as a whole. And, but nevertheless, Taylor County ranked in the fourth quartile with respect to um, these particular um, chronic outcomes, as you see here. Lung cancer deaths, lung cancer incidents, chronic lower respiratory disease hospitalizations, stroke deaths, stroke hospitalizations, heart failure deaths, congestive heart failure hospitalizations, diabetes deaths, and the corresponding hospitalizations. And so um, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry came to us and asked us to participate and write a research grant. Um, ATSER is a, is a component of the Center for Disease Control, okay? And um, they asked us to form partnerships with, for an example, Florida A&M University. Um, there was a law firm involved here, Wire Law, okay? So an environmental law firm. And then of course, the community-based organization that was impacted was called uh, True. This was a community-based organization, Taylor Residents for the Environment. And of course, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Well, we came together in a limited partnership to form the Taylor County No Coal Coalition, the, TN, the TCNCC. We'll refer to it as that from this point forward. And one of the um, aspects of trying to go through the process of helping a community develop a collective efficacy um, is listed here. And so this is what ended up being um, published as the blueprint for preventing environmental injustice in this community. And so here you see we've listed um, ways in which the community has to get active um, at the, at the um, level um, of, of the um, state and local municipality here, um, uh, steering committee. But the most important part that I like to highlight is you, you, we help the community develop this 
community principle, okay? What is a community principle? It's working together, teaching the community to work together as a part of working against each other to produce a high quality of life in terms of how them wanting to sustain it, okay? And then we help the community to understand that sustainable community growth is based on the effects of the man-made built environment upon the natural environment, okay? And so this is the concept that we just went over earlier in the lecture, and we help the community to understand that communities have to be, should be designed to be safe, healthy, economically strong and environmentally sound. So that constitutes what we refer to as a community principle. And then of course, uh, here are some other issues in terms of community assets and issues. Here, we try to stress to the community and to get them to identify what are your most important assets, okay? And um, the members of the community ultimately decided over a two and a half year period that a clean, healthy environment and the future of its children were its most valuable assets. And, and so we, we were very, very happy to, to see this occur. And so um, over that two and a half year period, as you imagine, we here in Vanderbilt went down there about every 90 days. Um, on um, either Tuesday nights or um, Thursday nights, depending upon whether the county commission or the local um, city council was, was meeting, okay? And this is, just, this is just listing some of the um, activities that we um, went through with the, with the, um, with the um, community residents down there. But um, in, in, um, in finality, um, what actually won out in all of this was the fact that um, the Taylor County No Co Coalition was able to just by mass action wear down um, the utility um, coalition because the utility coalition did not want to use best available technology in building that coal-fired electrical power plant. And so they actually gave up on the siding. And so by them giving up on the siding, the, um, the, um, the utility coalition, this actually represented a significant win for the Taylor County No Coal Coalition. And um, at last I checked, they still have not come back to the county, uh, to the residents in an attempt to build that coal-fired electrical power plant. So by the relentless pressure of the Taylor County No Coal Coalition, and please read the blueprint, it's one of the required readings there, you will see that um, the community actually by development of this collective efficacy as one of its community principles actually won. And so here in summary then for um, this lecture A, uh, the due diligence and hard work of the collective consortium of stakeholders culminated in our publishing the blueprint with that community. Um, the Taylor County No Coal Coalition augmented and ultimately prevented the siting and permitting of the proposed coal-fired electrical power plant. And based on that sustained relentless pressure that we applied, the utility consortium decided to suspend all permitting activities before um, the next step began. Um, which subsequently um, terminated um, their um, siting process. Um, proactive measures such as these can in part serve to decrease the potential adverse health outcomes associated with potential exposure to airborne environmental contaminants in susceptible high-risk vulnerable communities. Okay, And I'd like to thank you very much for um, going through this lecture with me. Uh, please, at this time, feel free to um, take your quiz and um, we'll then move to, uh, you can then read the syllabus to um, move into your case study. All right? Thank you very much and have a great rest of the day.
Go.